Hello and welcome to this OK Shippo presentation in our 2024 speaker series, Everyday Oklahoma, Fascinating Stories About Familiar Places. I'm Christina Wyckoff. I'm the historical archaeologist at the Oklahoma State Historic Preservation Office. And uh, we are so fortunate today to be joined by Susan Dragu. Susan is a writer, historian, photographer who's been exploring and writing about uh, historic resources across Oklahoma. And today her presentation is Rocks, Ruts, and Springs, Remnants of Early Trails Through Oklahoma. So Susan, I'm going to hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Christina. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. For about the past decade, as Christina said, I've been out exploring Oklahoma, discovering what I can of the state's early trails in particular, as well as other resources and writing about them and photographing them. Each one has a unique story and there are many more historic trails in the state than I can cover today. This afternoon, I'm gonna focus on a few of our state's most important early trails and show you some of the remnants of those that are still in evidence. Our focus will be on the Texas Road, the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road, the California Wagon Road and the Butterfield Overland Mail Stagecoach Route, which actually was a combination of the Texas Road and the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. In 1925, Oklahoma historian Grant Foreman wrote about the state's early trails saying, travel in those days in this country was an experience to challenge the stoutest hearts and constitutions. Roads were unknown. The surveyor had not been here. Oklahoma was an uncharted sea. The stars and a few physical features were the only guides. The cross timbers was the meridian of Greenwich to the navigator of the plains. But by the 1830s to 1850s, the Indian Territory had some well-established roads. To set the stage, this 1867 map shows the trails we're going to talk about today. The red line running north to south is the Texas Road a trade route beginning as early as 1802 and which by the 1820s served as a major highway for settlers immigrating to Texas. Eventually, this was the route used by the Missouri, Kansas and Texas or Katy Railroad, the first railroad to enter Indian Territory in 1872. It later became part of the Jefferson Highway and now it's the route of US Highway 69. The blue line is the California Road going east and west. It was established as such in 1849 at the beginning of the gold rush along the South Canadian River. This road became prominent when US Army Captain Randolph Barnes Marcy escorted a company of gold seekers to Santa Fe, New Mexico in the spring of 1849 on their way to California. And after that, it served thousands of 49ers who used this Southern route to the gold fields. The green line in the lower right part of the map <clears throat> is uh, the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. It was originally established for the Chickasaw removal. Boggy Depot or the Depot on Boggy originated in 1838 as the Western terminus of this trail. It was intended as a place to store supplies for the Chickasaws as they moved to their Western lands. With the establishment of Fort Washita in 1842, and the extension of the road to that point, it was also sometimes called the Fort Smith, Fort Washita Road. It converged with the Texas Road around Spring, Stringtown. And the, this route bore other names over time as well, including Stringtown to Fort Smith, Denison to Fort Smith, et cetera. In the 1840s and 1850s, which with the huge population shift to the Pacific coast, the clamor for a transcontinental railroad intensified as did the need for a reliable and efficient mechanism for delivering the mail from coast to coast. The railroad would end up having to wait until after the Civil War, but the first transcontinental stagecoach line was established by the US government in 1858 to carry the mail between the coasts. It was operated by the Overland Mail Company led by John Butterfield, and its route through Indian Territory used both the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road and the Texas Road from Fort Smith to Colbert's Ferry on the Red River. Now we'll talk a bit more about each one of these trails. 
Here's a map that more clearly depicts the Texas road. Again, it originated as a trade route between St. Louis and the domain of the Osage, who at one time dominated most of Missouri, Arkansas, Eastern Oklahoma, and Kansas. The trading family of uh, St. Louis fame and later of uh, Indian Territory fame, the Shotos, set up trading posts in present-day Oklahoma at the Grand Saline, where the town of Salina is now located, and at Three Forks, which is located at the junction of the Grand, Verdigree, and Arkansas rivers near Muskogee. The route became well-traveled over the years, used by immigrants, hunters, traders, explorers, and the military. It was named the Texas Road because so many settlers traveled to Texas along the road. In March 1845, it was reported that a thousand wagons had crossed the Red River into Texas in six weeks. As you can see by the map, it entered present-day Oklahoma near Baxter Springs, Kansas, traveling on the west bank and then the east bank of the Grand River down to Three Forks. It continued south, then crossing the Arkansas River to North Fork Town. From there, it went on through Perryville, now McAllister, Boggy Depot, and on to the Red River. Grant Foreman, who considered the Texas Road the most important of Oklahoma's early trails, wrote in 1936, for half a century until the coming of the railroad in 1872 and for many years after, thousands of restless home seekers were seen in motion along this road. The creaking and rattling ox-drawn wagons beside which the lanky drivers walked and popped their long whips, military expeditions, Civil War regiments of the North and South, exploring expeditions, trains of freighters, herds of wild horses being driven north, all these types of travelers passed over the great broad road and left scars on the prairie, which may be seen to this day. That was in 1936, but now nearly 90 years later, what can we still see of this road is the question. Here are some places you can visit along the Texas road today. And this would be a good time to mention that as you go out to explore these trails that we'll talk about today, consider that many sites are on private property, so be sure to get landowner permission. But during this presentation, I'm trying to focus on those that are publicly accessible. Now I'll briefly review each one of these sites along the Texas road. The Cabin Creek Battlefield is south of Veneta near Pensacola where the Texas road crossed Big Cabin Creek and it was the site of the Civil War Battle of Cabin Creek in July 1863. This was one of two important engagements between Union and Confederate forces in Indian Territory during the Civil War. The site is owned by the Oklahoma Historical Society and it is publicly accessible. There are no visible traces of the Texas road at the historic site. Uh, so I did, I did want to let you know that, but it is, uh, it is definitely a site that was along the Texas road. Now this is a salt kettle located in the center of the town of Salina. It's the main historical remnant of Choteau's Grand Saline, which was located near an important salt spring, thus the name Grand Saline. This monument is found right along Highway 20 in a city park in Salina. A little farther south near Maisie is Union Mission. This is a very important site along the Texas Road. It was established in 1820. It was the first Protestant mission in Indian Territory, a mission to the Osages. It was the location of the Indian Territory's first school and the first printing press. And the first book that was printed in Indian Territory was printed here. In addition to several monuments, there's a cemetery here, and uh, this pavilion houses the remains of Epaphras Chapman, who founded the mission. Chapman died in, in 1825, um, and this is his gravestone. And this marker at, may actually be the oldest monument in Oklahoma. There are also Shoto family graves. These were originally located southwest of the Union Mission Cemetery. They had been desecrated by vandals and the markers discarded, and then those were rescued and moved here to this cemetery in around 2001. Moving farther south, just outside of OK, Oklahoma, at the Verdigree River Bridge, this is a monument to the Texas Road and other important 
sites in the region, including not only Three Forks, the Creek and Osage agencies, um, and uh, Washington Irving, Washington Irving's uh, visit to um, this part of the country, which he wrote about very colorfully in A Tour on the Prairies, which is a great read. At Baycomb College in Muskogee, there's another salt kettle. And I think these are interesting as a reminder of the work involved in obtaining this precious element that we take for granted or try to reduce in our diets. Um, but these, uh, these early day folks had to obtain water from salt springs, boil it in these huge kettles to produce salt to preserve meat and season food. Now, this is a map of the important trading center of Three Forks, which I mentioned. And I know it's hard to read, but hopefully you can see the three rivers converging there. The Verdigree on the top, coming from the top left. The Grand, which comes from the top right. And the Arkansas coming in from the bottom. The um, Texas Road comes in from the north between the Grand and the Verdigree. It crosses uh, and then continues on to the southwest, south of the Arkansas River. And over on the right is where, on the east bank of the Grand River is where um, Fort Gibson is located. Another great spot along the Texas Road. In fact, Fort Gibson is celebrating its bicentennial this year. It was built in 1824, and what you see here is a replica of the original stockade that was built in the 1930s. The replica was, that is. But there are also original buildings from the fort's later period located at the historic site. I also want to mention the Three Rivers Museum in Muskogee, which is a great resource for information about this region. And perhaps the best place in Oklahoma to experience the Texas Road is the Honey Springs Battlefield. This photo shows a bridge abutment on the Texas Road, which is on one of the walking trails you can visit at Honey Springs today. The Battle of Honey Springs was the largest Civil War military engagement to take place in Indian Territory and occurred on July 17, 1863. We don't have time to go into the details and significance of the battle today, but I highly recommend a visit to this historic site which has a new visitor center and is located east of Highway 69 between Oktaha and Rentiesville. Lastly, this is a map of North Fork Town. It was at the junction of the North Canadian and the South Canadian rivers. The North Canadian, of course, is actually the North Branch of the Canadian River, which we around here commonly call the South Canadian. And again, it's, it's difficult to read, but uh, the route of the Texas Road comes in from the top right corner, crosses the river, and then continues towards the southwest through North Fork Town. The site of the city of Eufaula is just off to the left. And this was an important site for resupply and a meeting place for travelers. The California Road went right through North Fork Town. So it was the junction of the Texas Road and the California Road. And today, this site is beneath the waters of Lake Eufaula. So moving on to the California Wagon Road, as I mentioned earlier, this route was taken by Randolph Marcy in 1849. Again, it's the blue line crossing east to west on this map along the Canadian River. Uh, Marcy uh, in 1849 in the spring took a company of gold seekers to all the way to Santa Fe, New Mexico. And in the Indian Territory, his route ran 434 miles. On that trip, it took 50 days for the company to cross with uh, several hundred people and many, many ox-drawn wagons. It was a very, very slow way to travel. But um, it was faster, according to Marcy, than the more than northern Santa Fe Trail. So it it definitely had an advantage and was was uh, became very popular. Here are some places to visit uh, on the California Trail, and in the eastern Oklahoma there aren't as many as in western Oklahoma, but we'll we'll get into that a little bit more. We start, of course, at Fort Smith, which of course is not in Oklahoma, but uh, it is really the 
portal to early Oklahoma history and was the portal to the Southwest when it was founded in 1817. These are the foundations of the 1817 fort. There are several foundations uh, of, that they've excavated at the historic site. And at the time it was founded, it was the westernmost military post in the United States. From Fort Smith, the road crossed the Poto River and went through present day Spyro, actually the Choctaw Agency at Scullyville. It followed approx the approximate course of present highway, State Highway 31, which goes through Quinton and Kinta and McCurtain, and then followed the course of the South Canadian. It went through the present site of Ada, where a spot called Delaware Mount was celebrated for its beauty overlooking uh, the park-like setting of the area. It's unclear today exactly where Delaware Mount is, but I took this photo from um, a high hill in Ada where the Robert S. Kerr cabin is located. And the view from there really suggests uh, perhaps this is the vista that they were talking about. It was quite beautiful. Continuing west, we get into some really spectacular ruts left by wagons traveling this road. This, uh, this is Art Peters with a um, <clears throat> tape measure measuring the depth of some ruts in the sandstone near Hinton. And what was going on here was these uh, wagons were, being, were descending uh, this slab of sandstone and to keep them from running away, they were, they were held back with a, a brake and, and by whatever means they held back the wagon and the mules from going down too quickly. Um, because these, uh, the wheels weren't rolling, but rather skidding, they eroded very deep ruts into the sandstone. There are quite a few of these ruts in the area. And um, Art has actually explored and excavated many sites along the California Wagon Road between, well, from Tuttle West to the Texas border. He's the curator of the Hinton Historical Museum and uh, you can learn a lot more from him. I'll talk about that in just a minute. But the best place to see some, some of these ruts, not these exact ones because these are on private property there, but there are some great ruts in Red Rock Canyon Adventure Park. It used to be Red Rock Canyon State Park, but now it's owned by the city of Hinton. It's a really nice park. And uh, there are some ruts that look quite a bit like this. Uh, Along, that are along the road and uh, you can get to them fairly easily. That's another, that's a, a picture of the same or nearby ruts looking, looking down. This odd looking mound behind art is Rock Mary. It's one of many natural mounds in the area. This is west of Hinton. Uh, this is on private property, but is visible from the road from a, a certain standpoint. It was named during the 1849 Marcy expedition for a young woman who was among the company traveling to California. The full story of Rock Mary is quite entertaining. And in fact, OETA produced a really nice documentary on it uh, in their Back in Time series. It was called Digging the Wagon Road. It was released about a year ago and you can find it on the OET website and, and learn a lot more. And then as we continue west, you see these mounds and you can actually see these from I-40 if you're traveling west, if you start, start looking to the south after you pass uh, the Hinton exit, uh, because they, they certainly do stand out against the flat landscape. And they served as landmarks for tra early travelers along the road. The, uh, here's one, this is my favorite. It's, it's not one you see from Interstate 40, but this is, this is called Chimney Mound. And um, it's, there's a, um, an illustration made by the artist Heinrich Mulhausen in 1853, when he was with the Whipple Expedition doing a railroad survey. And he drew this 
chimney mound and it's fun to compare the two photos or the two images. I'm sorry, I don't have a copy of that uh, in this presentation, but that is chimney mound. As you continue west along the Canadian, you can see sites like this. This is these breaks in the landscape. There's an actual hoodoo there, which you don't see very many hoodoos in Oklahoma. And um, this is a, a baby who died on the wagon road going west in one of the cemeteries out, out that, in that direction. And then it, finally, we get to the Antelope Hills, which um, indicated that travelers were leaving the Indian Territory. It was the, near the 100th meridian. And uh, so this is sort of the end of the line for the California Wagon Road as far as the Indian Territory segment of it. I highly recommend visiting the Hinton Historical Museum, which is on the south side of Hinton. It is just to the north of the entry to the Red Rock Canyon Adventure Park. And you can talk to Art Peters, you can pick up uh, books on how to find the mounds, legends about the mounds and the canyons of the area, the full story of uh, Rock Mary and see artifacts that Art has uh, located during his uh, archaeological work in the area. Now on to our third trail, the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road and the Butterfield Overland Mail. Again, that is the green line running southwest in the right, the bottom right corner of the map. Now this map I realize is not very legible, but it's an 1838 map of what became the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. And it was prepared to mark out a route for the Chickasaws to follow to their new lands in the West. It started at the Choctaw Agency, which is uh, Scullyville or Spyro today. It went south on the Fort Towson Road for some distance and then turn west, picking up what we presently consider the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road, crossing the Fushmaling River, eventually getting to the clear Boggy River, which was where Boggy Depot was established. This is a present day map of the Indian Territory segment of the Butterfield Overland Mail route, which includes the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. It enters the Indian Territory or Oklahoma from Fort Smith, just like the California Road did. They both went to Choctaw Agency before branching off in different directions. And it goes through Spyro, Wilburton, Atoka, and Durant uh, before crossing the Red River. To give you the full picture, here is a national map of the Butterfield Overland Mail. To get the mail to California, it was brought to St. Louis by train, then on to Tipton, Missouri, again by train. That was then the Western terminus of the Pacific Railroad. Then from Tipton, it was loaded on a stagecoach for the trip out west. So you can see that red line, uh, the top right of the red line is St. Louis. The mail was also brought to Memphis, Tennessee, which um, is on the, the right hand, the bottom of that right hand side of the red line uh, where it's bifurcated. And this was called the bifurcated route because it had two termini. So the mail uh, brought to Memphis was then also sent on to Fort Smith and the, the two mails from St. Louis and from Memphis were merged onto one stagecoach in Fort Smith. From there, the route went through Southeastern Indian Territory, mostly the Choctaw Nation, but also a portion of the Chickasaw Nation, then through Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona to California and up to San Francisco, about 2,800 miles. It ran from 1858 to 1861, when with the impending Civil War, it was moved north. It was the longest stagecoach line of its time, preceding the Transcontinental Telegraph and the short-lived Pony Express, and it came 11 years before the Transcontinental Railroad. 
It was hailed as a huge innovation and delivered mail and carried passengers from end to end in about 23 days on average. Before this time, mail was delivered by steamship, traveling south along the Atlantic coast, crossing an isthmus overland in Mexico or Central America, often it was in Panama, boarding another steamship and then traveling north to its destination on the Pacific coast. In January of 2023, the Butterfield Overland Mail was designated a National Historic Trail. This means that the National Park Service is now working to create an implementation plan, which will include help with signage, and enhancing tourism opportunities along the entire trail. For an even greater perspective of the national trail system, here's there are a lot of national trails and this includes recreation trails as well as historic trails. But one thing I wanna point out is that Oklahoma actually has three national historic trails. The, in, in addition to the Butterfield, the Santa Fe Trail crosses the far northwestern corner of the Panhandle. And then the Trail of Tears, uh, of course, comes into Oklahoma on the east side and actually comes in as far west as Gore. So these are some important places along the trail. <clears throat> and I'll cover these in, in detail as we go along. But as you can see, there are some, some really, um, I mean, this goes way back to 1832, the Edward Store, 1850. Uh, and that Edward Store is the, uh, the only standing structure along the Choctaw Nation of the trail, the Choctaw Nation segment of the trail. And it's, um, it's an active living, living thing as we, as we will talk about uh, shortly. <clears throat> So um, just moving along, in the 200 miles of the Butterfield Trail that ran through the Indian Territory, there were 12 Butterfield stations and they were an average of 16 miles apart. And these stations existed primarily to provide a change of horses for the stagecoach, which ran night and day. The, um, the average speed of the stagecoach was about five and a half miles per hour across the Indian Territory. And when we say stagecoach, I do want to point out that actually for 70% of the Butterfield, the vehicles used were not the stagecoaches that you might envision, the typical Concord stagecoach, stagecoach that you'd see in the movies. They were stage wagons. They were called celerity wagons, celerity meaning speed. And they were uh, lighter weight and intended to handle rough roads. So I will use the term stagecoach, but oftentimes we are really talking about a stage wagon. And, and definitely it was a stage wagon that came across the Indian Territory. We also talk about teams of horses, but actually mules were used quite a lot on um, uh, the Butterfield. And uh, so I'm just using those the terms interchangeably. So when I talk about horses, know that mules might have been involved as well. Uh, so again, these, uh, <clears throat> these stations existed to provide a change of horses for the stagecoach, ran night and day. It was quite a rough experience for passengers. They didn't get to get off and spend the night. Um, they just had to try to sleep in the wagon. Most of the stations in Indian Territory uh, were operated by citizens of the Choctaw and Chickasaw Nations. And in 1958, for the celebration of the Butterfield's centennial, which was actually quite a big deal, a committee from the Oklahoma Historical Society located and marked all the Butterfield stations in Oklahoma and placed markers made of concrete and bronze, most of which still stand today. This is the marker for Walker's Station, which still sits at Scullyville on the northeastern edge of Spyro. The station keeper was Tandy Walker, who was governor of the Choctaw Nation at the time. The old station house at Walker's originated as the Choctaw Agency built around 1832. That was established 
at the time of the beginning of the removal of the Choctaws from their home in Mississippi. And this was where the government agent lived and um, worked out details related to the migrations that were occurring. And it, later on, uh, the annuities of, uh, for the Choctaws were paid uh, here at the agency. Uh, so this photo actually was taken in the 1920s after the dog trot log cabin had been weatherboarded. And this structure burnt in 1947, at which time it was the oldest standing structure in Oklahoma. So today we can still see the depression of the stagecoach road at Walker's. That's what you see on the left. And it's really difficult to, sometimes to capture in a photograph these swales or depressions in the road. You can see it when you're standing there and it, it looks fairly significant, but it's hard to see it in a picture like this. But that, that is the depression of the stagecoach road at Walker's Station. And then on the right hand side, you can see a pipe that is coming out of the a, a wooden structure. This is Agency Spring, and it's had various names over time, but it is the same spring that the uh, travelers used at Walker's Station and probably before, um, even before 1832, I would imagine. It's still piped to the road for public use. You can just drive right up and drink out of that. I've done it, and it was, it was safe. <laughs> also in this area is the historic Scullyville Cemetery, where Tandy Walker is buried, and the New Hope Cemetery, as well as the Spiral Mounds being just up the road. So this is an area of great historical riches. The next Butterfield Station is Treherns, which is also the site of an important Choctaw Council House. The Choctaw Nation was divided after removal into three political districts. Actually, it was the same division, political divisions that existed under their government in Mississippi. Each district had its own chief and each district chief was to have a house built for him under the 1830 Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. Well, Shula Tubby, who was an important leader from the old days before removal and was a district chief also before removal, um, was also chief of the Northern District after removal, and his council house was built here at Treherns. It stood by a spring, which became known as Council House Spring. That's my husband, Bill, uh, at Council House Spring, and you can see the, the rock surrounding the spring. It is still flowing. It's not gushing, but there it, it is still flowing. Unfortunately, that tree behind Bill um, actually fell not too long ago and disrupted the uh, western wall of the spring and uh, so it doesn't quite look like that now but uh, it is there is still part of it remaining uh, well, this is these are cut stones that are near the spring we have looked for what might be the location of the actual council house it's really not clear. We, we were um, fortunate to have the uh, Choctaw Nation and uh, historic preservation office and folks from the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey out to help us. And um, so that's that's still in review, I guess I can say. But um, over the years, it's been difficult for people to pinpoint the exact location of that council house. Farther, farther down the road, I mentioned the Edwards store, and this is really a special place. It's the only standing structure along the Choctaw Nation segment of the Butterfield that's contemporaneous with the Overland Mail. And I put the uh, Edwards store website here so you can get more information. It was built in 1850, and a later addition was made in 1870, and this may have been a, a meal stop for stagecoach passengers. I'm going to go forward because I wanted to show you this 18, this 1930 view of the cabin. You can see that um, chimney there. 
um, efforts are underway to preserve and restore the cabin. And, and you can see the same chimney in this photo on the left, as well as these hand-hewn logs on the right. It's, uh, it's very well preserved, uh, but there's a lot of work being done really to, um, to preserve it for the long term and restore it. Um, so far, this is the only site along the Indian Territory segment where um, any significant archaeological work has been done. Uh, Amanda Rainier and staff at the Oklahoma Archaeological Survey, with the assistance of a number of other entities, have been able to coordinate some small scale archaeological investigations at the Edwards Store site around the preservation work at the cabin. And the field work has included geophysical investigations, a metal, metal detector survey at the property, precision mapping of metal detector results and site features, and some limited test excavations in areas expected to be impacted by the cabin restoration. And they, those are primarily around the kitchen area and the store itself, which was a separate structure from the cabin that still exists today. This is um, a map showing, uh, on the left is the same in, image that was on the previous side, uh, pre previous slide, I'm sorry. And then on the right shows some of the archeological findings. I wanted to show you though, this, uh, this next slide. Um, the archeologists archeolo were able to find artifacts from the site's early occupation in the 19th century, as well as some that reflect the continued use of the site throughout the 20th century. And uh, one of the things that we uh, have found is that the store structure was actually later used as a blacksmith shop. And these archeological findings confirm that um, these, uh, these artifacts that you see in the photos were found there. And Let's see, there's some um, pottery that was found in the kitchen area. So although the building, the store building and its foundations are no longer standing, uh, the archaeologists, sorry, archaeologists are confident they've been able to determine that the actual location of the store. So continuing on west from the Edwards store, uh, there's another Butterfield station at a location called the Narrows, which is just what it suggests. It's a gap in the mountains that the road went through. This is a small cemetery that is located near Holloway Station. It's just up above the county road. And then um, <clears throat> we get to Red Oak, Oklahoma, which the Edwards store was originally, uh, was the original Red Oak, and uh, it was uh, established as a Red Oak post office in 1868, but when the railroad came, Red Oak was moved to its present location. But this photo is an example of the kinds of road traces we find out in the woods, this one being in the Red Oak vicinity. The people in the, in the picture are my friends and great boosters of the Butterfield in Latimer County, Earl Shero and June Chubbuck, who June is also a champion for the Edwards store. Latimer County, by the way, has the most Butterfield sites of any county in Oklahoma. So, but you can see is a very clear um, road-like appearance on this uh, pathway. You'll continue on to Rattle, Riddle Station to the east of Wilburton. And just by the way, when you're in that area, a great place to stay overnight is Robbers Cave State Park and one of my favorite places to hike. A few miles to the southwest of Wilburton on top of a mountain is a small relay station, not an official Butterfield station, but it had a good spring and the stages probably stopped there for water for the horses after ascending the hill. It's called Mountain Station and there is still a cemetery there. This sign was present when we first started doing our research, but has since been replaced with a no trespassing sign. But you can imagine that a sign like that invites you to explore and I did and we found the spring it is just off the road and it is still flowing as well. There's a fascinating story related to Mountain Station and photographer Edward Mybridge, who was involved in the stagecoach accident there in 1860. Mybridge is considered the grandfather of motion pictures in that he was the first to use stop motion photography, trying to capture Leland Stanford's horses in midair. 
Before he was a photographer, though, he was a bookseller and was traveling from San Francisco to the East Coast on the Butterfield stage when leaving Mountain Station, the horses got away from the driver and the brake wasn't working. The stage crashed into the trees. Everyone on the stagecoach was injured and one was killed. My bridge sustained a severe head injury, which he did recover from, but some have speculated that the head injury changed his personality and may have made him the obsessive, eccentric, and creative person he became, perhaps stimulating his later work in the 1870s, during which his notable inventions came about. This was also the only accident fatal to a Butterfield passenger. A man named Andrew Mackey died in the accident, and there's a marker in the Mountain Station Cemetery in his memory. Again, out in the woods in many places, we find traces of the old trail. This one is leaving Mountain Station and heading down toward the next station at Pusley's. You can see here in a few places, uh, rocks stacked along the side of the trail. And if you've, if you've ever seen something, a, a path that's created by a road grader <clears throat> and all the earth and rock that's pushed up along the side of the uh, the path of the road grader, and you can see how, how different this is, that there's a path that still exists, that there are signs of someone uh, marking the path or moving large um, obstacles out of its way, but it's, it's definitely um, an old road that we're seeing here. At Pusley's, there's still this old well, as well as the family grave plot, the line of the old road is easy to see across this tract of land, although it's not depicted in this photo. Beyond Pusley's is Waddell Station, and this is a shot of the old road taken about 1930. From here, you enter the Wa Otoka Wildlife Management Area, where there are remains of a stage stand called Breadtown. It's not a Butterfield stand, but is a contemporary and that's not hard to get to. And again, that is publicly accessible. Of course, if you go on a wildlife management area, you do need either a hunting license, a fishing license, or a conservation passport. And you wanna be sure that you check to see um, whether hunting season is open or not, because you probably don't wanna go there unless you're hunting. Um, and, uh, but, the old road went right through the wildlife management area, and there are some traces still visible. <clears throat> um, just last week, darn my my picture, I I failed to get my picture in here. It's uh, I, I thought I did, but I didn't. But just last week, I was at the Atoka Wildlife Management Area and uh, mapping some traces through through there, and I found a spot at a small stream crossing where there were, were some large stones stood on their ends, especially one large triangular stone that seemed to be marking that stream crossing. Ordinarily, you might think that uh, seeing stones stood on their end like that could be grave markers, but the location of this suggests it might be otherwise. So those were kind of a, a neat find. The next station moving west is Geary Stand at the North Boggy Creek Crossing. Now this was inundated by the Atoka Reservoir in 1959, but you can hike a stretch of the trail on the east side of the lake and it's easy to get to, it's right off the road, it's not however marked. Um, so yeah, if you contact me, I can give you the information on, on how to get there and it is on public land. Uh, this marker, this historical marker, was placed on the dam of Lake Atoka, and the actual Geary Station is straight north of the uh, dam. On the west side of Lake Atoka, we can <clears throat> find some pretty impressive road traces. Uh, this area has been closed off from vehicular access since 1955, and the road had actually been abandoned before 1930. You either have to hike in several miles from the south uh, end of the lake or take a boat to this spot, but it is public land. And I don't know if you can see this. This is, um, <clears throat> I had, uh, I was accompanied by folks from the Choctaw Nation and, and also from Shippo uh, going out to this trace west of Lake Atoka. And um, our friends at the Choctaw Nation did some mapping. This shows that 
that trace of the road on the west side of Lake Atoka that we hiked. And what's really neat is to see it, if you can see the turquoise um, <clears throat> line that is overlaid on the black line, this is a historic topo map showing the old road and showing that uh, we were actually on that road during our hike. South of Lake Atoka, near the crossing of the Middle Boggy River, a stretch of the trail has been nicely preserved and memorialized at the Atoka County Museum. There's also a Civil War cemetery here. Uh, it's along US Highway 69. So at this point, the Texas road has converged with this route. Beyond Atoka is Boggy Depot, which we've discussed. Um, already as the, the other end of the Fort Smith Boggy Depot Road. This was the largest settlement along the Indian Territory segment of the Overland Mail Road. Today, there are no structures still standing at Boggy Depot, but this house, which was, I think this photograph was from the late 1800s, was the home of the Reverend Allen Wright, who served as Choctaw governor and is famous for suggesting the Choctaw word Oklahoma meaning red people, for the name of the territory. There is a historic cemetery here and some interpretive signage. It's a recreation area now and you can camp and it, it just makes a lovely spot for an overnight stay. The next station is Nails Crossing on the Blue River. This is on private property. Um, the Blue River, uh, this is where the stagecoach crossed in this shallow spot on the Blue River. This is a 1930 photo of the station house, uh, the home of Jonathan Nail at Nail's Crossing. This is a cistern that we can still see at the site. And if you can make out the uh, stonework here that is, you could, there are a lot of leaves in between a couple of rows of stone. This appears to be a stairway down into a cellar. So there's some, these are typical remnants for sites like this, cisterns and foundations and so forth. On the other side of the Blue River is the site of Fort McCullough, which was a Confederate encampment established by Albert Pike in 1863. <clears throat> there were no permanent structures erected here except for the earthworks. And <clears throat> that's uh, my husband, Bill, and the property owner standing on top of some of the earthworks there, as well as these are some artifacts that have been found in the area by the property owner. A short distance to the west of Fort McCullough and the Blue River is the Fort Washita historic site, which is really just a beautiful place. This structure is what's left of an old barracks, and this is owned and operated by the Chickasaw Nation now. Really uh, highly recommend you stop there. After this, the trail went to Fisher's Station also known as Carriage Point. This was, it kind of turned, it had been traveling southwest, it kind of turns due south towards, goes down to Fisher's Station. Uh, this is just west of Durant. And here there's an old well, there's an, there are uh, uh, another old well and a grave marker there as well. Again, this is on private property. Continuing on as you pass through Colbert, Oklahoma, is the Alberson House. This is now in the Chickasaw Nation. We've been in the Choctaw Nation up until the uh, Fishers Station. And when you get beyond Fishers, then you enter the Chickasaw Nation. And this house is along the old road. It was built by Chickasaw leader Isaac Alberson in 1844. Um, it, this is on private property, but you can see it quite easily from the road. Lastly, is Colbert's Ferry on the Red River. The ferry was first established in 1853 by Benjamin Franklin Colbert. Of course, there's no longer a ferry here, but this marker's in good shape on a road near the site, and 
from the road, you can see the family cemetery with uh, Benjamin Franklin or B.F. Colbert's large headstone. We visited Colbert's Ferry in December of 2022, and I took the photo on the left near the original ferry landing. You can compare it with the photo from 1872 on the right and see that we were very close to the same spot, just back a little farther than the photographer who took the older photo. The bridge piling in the background is that of the Red River Company's 1915 toll bridge. That bridge was a big part of the controversy between Texas and Oklahoma that became known as the Red River Bridge War. That was in 1931. What happened was that a free bridge had been built across the Red River, but toll bridge owners obtained an injunction against its opening because they were supposed to get paid for their bridges and had not. The Texas governor complied with the injunction and blocked off the free bridge, but Oklahoma Governor Alfalfa Bill Murray disagreed and wanted it open. It never became a shooting war, but it became very intense when Murray called up the National Guard and even declared martial law for a brief time. It all got settled peaceably within a couple of days, but was quite the drama at the time. This is a closer look at the pilings of the toll bridge, which was destroyed by a gas pipeline explosion around 1960 and later demolished, except for these huge pilings, of course, and a tremendous amount of the wreckage is lying in the river and on the banks, all this, these huge pieces of metal. It's really quite fascinating. So here we are now looking across the Red River to Texas at the end of our trip. You can see this spot from the Highway 69 bridge crossing into Texas. I've had to skip over a lot of detail, but there is plenty to see of the old road along the Oklahoma stretch of the Butterfield and the rural nature of the road allows you to feel like you are really traveling back in time. Again, here are some places to visit along the Butterfield Road that are publicly accessible. Numerous cemeteries where there are uh, traces of the road going through, as well as the Edwards Store, Lake Atoka, the Atoka Wildlife Management Area, Atoka County Museum, Boggy Depot, and Fort Washita. Fort Washita was not uh, on the trail per se, but, but was just off the trail and was uh, uh, significant to the trail. Some resources for the uh, Indian Territory segment of the Butterfield Trail and for all these trails, really, the State Historic Preservation Office, obviously. The Chronicles of Oklahoma um, are just a tremendous resource and um, I have compiled the work that has been published in the Chronicles over the years about the Butterfield, as well as my own publications about the Butterfield on the, the site that is listed there. It's my website. Another really valuable site uh, is civilwaralbum.com. And I'm not sure if this is live now. I tried to visit it the other day and, and it did not appear to be, but hopefully that will be restored. But there is a page about the Butterfield in Indian Territory with some great resources, some good photos and GPS coordinates as well. And that has been developed by Dr. Carol Messer and his colleagues. Suggested reading on the Texas Road and the California Road would be the Jefferson Highway in Oklahoma by Johnita Mullins, which is uh, of course, the Texas Road became the Texas, the Jefferson Highway before it was U.S. Highway 69. And Marcy and the Gold Seekers by Grant Foreman, who I've mentioned earlier, which includes both Randolph Marcy's journal and other journals from that period. That's all the material that I have to present today. I would just be happy to entertain any questions. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Susan. This has been a fantastic presentation. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and these incredible photographs and participating in our in our 2024 speaker series. We really appreciate it. Thank you.